the danger. Dan! Hi, I'm your guidance counselor, and I'd like to talk to you about your plan for the future. Nope! Right, one thing I forgot to mention in the last episode was that I forgot to talk about Bertha and Nostradamus. Because uh, in the episode, uh, Nostradamus is keeping Bertha imprisoned in this cage, in which he has in his chambers behind a tapestry and he gives her scraps of food and shames her and calls her a monster and he's like he's not a very nice guy is he out of pity he hands bertha a doll little doll little cloth doll and bertha tears it open with her mouth pulls out a wooden stick that um was used to stop the thing from going floppy i guess and then she waits for the next time Nostradamus comes to see her and then she shanks him in the neck and runs off. But Nostradamus doesn't die from this. He just, he gets better. I got better. So Bertha is free to roam about the castle again and it really was very, very pointless. <laughs> so episode 10 of... Raid. <sighs> that yawn was not deliberate, but... It was kind of indicative, as I'm just tired. The episode is called Sacrifice. The last time I saw a TV episode called Sacrifice, it sent everyone who watched it into an existential crisis. When I'm thirsty, it feels how I feel when I'm alone. What? Golly, things sure have changed around here. So we open with another, another, another. We open with another terribly choreographed fight scene because Bassie's got a security guard now who used to look after him when he was younger but now that he's the regent of France he's been brought back. They're having a sparring bit and Bassie is taught to spot the knife that is hidden because there's always going to be another, another knife. It's basically kind of like that sparring scene between Brienne and Arya in Game of Thrones Season 7. They're f initially fighting with swords, but the second someone looks cornered, someone's going to bring out a knife and get you in the throat with it, just as you think you've gotten yourself into a winning situation. So Bassi's supposed to be the Regent of France, and Mary reminds him you're supposed to be in the throne room talking to people, and he's just like, oh, let Lord Hugo do it, Who, whoever this guy called Lord Hugo is. Let him do it, but then Mary's like, no, if you're going to be legitimised and be made the next King of France, you should uh, put yourself forward. And he's like, fine, I will. He looks very out of place in court garb with a chain around his shoulders and talking to people. Basically, he is very much out of his depth. He sucks at it. <laughs> it is kind of funny to see like Torrance Coons play up how uncomfortable and inexperienced he is about this whole thing. And he's just like, oh, God, I hate this job. Is it really for the welfare of my brother? But a woman called Isabel is brought to him in chains and he appears to recognise her and she's very heavily pregnant. Oh my god. She looks as if they cut out a bowl and then stuck it under her dress or they put a pillow under her dress or something. It looks like a very fake bump. And a woman comes to welcome Bassi as the new regent and she seems friendly enough but she gets closer and Bassi's security guard, whose name I can't remember, noticed that she's got a knife up her sleeve and she stopped just before Bassi can get attacked and it turns out that knife was poisoned so even if she just cut him with the knife he would have been poisoned. Well, the bodyguard gets his hand slashed a little bit but I don't think he dies from the poison, he just gets like a small bit of it and they use a poultice to stay the poison. I'm just going to be playing with things that rustle. Meanwhile, Catherine de Medici is up in her tower and she is pretty still much living in the lap of luxury. She's got, she's got a lovely strawberry tart with her and she's got tapestries and jewellery and nice clothes and nice food and Mary's not very happy about that and she's pretty confident that there's not going to be an annulment and obviously it was her that tried to kill Bassi through Lord Hugo and Mary is annoyed that she's able to actually make contact with people so she uses her own authority as Queen of Scotland to get the servants to remove all the nice things in the room till she's literally just left with a bed and a chamber pot. Someone just tried to kill Bash. Well it's Sebastian all right. I said tried to kill him. Well is he injured? How did this happen? Ah, uh, were you hoping I'd let something slip? Some clue that confirmed I had something to do with this? Well, 
Is there anyone in the kingdom who wants Bash dead more than you? <laughs> Any nobleman, I'd say, for starters. Anyone who loves France enough to wish it a proper king. Didn't Henry say that if anything happened to Bash, he'd have your head? <laughs> Even Henry can't execute a queen without trial, and trials demand evidence. Ha! Ha! Catherine Howard would like a word. Except she can't because she's dead. And Anne Boleyn had a sham trial at best. Anyway, so she has the room stripped and it turns out the pregnant woman that came in earlier is Bassie's cousin. It's kind of dis difficult to explain. So the father of the cousin is a disgraced half-brother of Diane de Poitier and the appearance of the girl at court whose husband died or no she was impregnated out of wedlock and the father was killed before he could come back and marry her so this is obviously another scheme from Catherine who is working with Lord Hugo this is a way of exposing Bassey as unfit to be king because he's got traitors in his bloodline so they decide we have to get her out the castle but if Catherine's got allies within the castle we have to do this discreetly so we'll disguise her as a noble and we'll transport her somewhere safe for her to have her baby and then we'll get her somewhere safer still but she is very close to her time and Mary can recognize this because when she was at the convent she was witness to a lot of babies being born which she really shouldn't have because the custom at the time was virgins couldn't be present during the birth of children but obviously I mean that was a nunnery so there was that was that was a whole different matter altogether but she might have watched from the shadows or she might have just been interested in learning baby rearing basically we have someone who sort of knows how pregnant women work and they dress her up in this hideous looking dress and to be fair they all acknowledge that she looks awful and they sneak her out of the castle in a carriage and Catherine's guards who are loyal to her follow them however they decide let's go through the bloodwood because the guards wouldn't follow there because they're too scared of the pagans and unfortunately that is when Isabella goes into labour or Isabel, or whatever her name is, she goes into labour and they have to erect a tent. She has to give birth in the Bloodwood and it's, it's scary for Mary because of the um, the pagans and while they're waiting for the, the time she realises that there are totems and symbols around the tent and she thinks that the pagans put them there to mark them for sacrifice so she knocks them down and then Bassie panics because he actually put them up to guard against being attacked. And as the pagans close in, she walks out and then she walks towards them and towards the, the, the strange noises. And I'm just like, yes, Mary, walk towards the ominous chanting voices when you know these people can do human sacrifices. And then she runs back in the tent and while they're hearing the people coming, Bassi, Isabel and the, the bodyguards start chanting the language of the pagans to show that, oh, no, we were on your side. We're cool. And instead of sacrificing them the pagans kill one of their horses and they just leave them be and it's a bit silly and Bassi has to say look my family is associated with a branch of these pagans we're not the we're not as bloodthirsty as they are like I learned all these words and chants when I was little so they've stuck in my head as if they were a nursery rhyme and Mary is just like but these are the same people that tried to kill me and he says, the group of people I learned all these pagan rituals from aren't interested in human sacrifice. This is a much more violent version of this pagan practice. Because, you know, it turns out all religions have a really ridiculously violent segment. And so Mary is then okay with it. Well, she doesn't have to like it, but at least she's not dead. And Isabel gives birth to her child and it's a girl, but they never actually name the child because I thought that Isabel was going to name the child Mary after Mary as thanks for helping her give birth or when, spoiler alert, Isabel dies from in childbirth, um, Mary was going to name the child Isabel but we never actually got to hear what they were going to call the baby and the next morning as they begin to set out again they realise Isabel is bleeding out because of the birth and she bleeds out and she dies. This may sound familiar, she begs Bassi to promise that he will look after the child and make sure she doesn't come to harm. Her last words are, promise me Bash, promise me. Turns out that child is actually the true heir to the Iron Throne. But seriously, that in that death scene, it actually had more dramatic weight to it than Ailey's death. It seemed much more poignant. So Mary and, and Bassi take the baby back to the castle and they 
asked the nursemaid to put her in the royal nursery for a bit because obviously they, they there's just a, a nursery of royal babies or noble babies until they can think of what to do and they notice there's a little mark on the baby's foot that Isabel put there and it could be construed as a pagan mark but thank goodness the baby will be safe now and they bring Isabel's body to the privy council to show that she's died and they ask what happened to the child she was carrying and they say we don't know we've we we found her this way is perhaps she gave birth and then abandoned it and it hurts Bassie to pretend that she was a criminal. He and Mary go to bury her and they have a little funeral service for her and he shows her there's a rather than leave flowers on her grave there's a ritual where they cut their hands open and uh, bleed onto the grave and Mary partakes in it. I, I got the context mixed up. I thought that Mary Queen of Scots was a lot like Bloody Mary. She would be all down with this sort of thing, careful now. She was a lot more tolerant of re- of different religions than Bloody Mary because when she got to Scotland she acknowledged that there were a lot of Protestants and a lot of the people who served on her Privy Council were Protestant. Says to John Knox, like, I will tolerate your religion and I will allow you the free use of your conscience so long as I have the free use of mine. But she still insisted on remaining Catholic and not converting and having a priest. So therefore when she learns that there are a bunch of pagans that aren't actually that harmful, she would probably be more tolerant of it. So I guess they got that right. And before Mary goes on the trip that ends up with Isabel's death, she asks her ladies, the the other three Marys, to watch over Catherine and make sure that she is cut off from all communication and doesn't start anything while they're away. And once again, we have people trying to do secret plans but they're talking at full volume so anyone could hear them. They could have easily been speaking English or they could speak Scots because these girls are supposed to be Scottish or they could speak Greek. If they were trying to establish that they were speaking in another language that so as to not rile up suspicion, not to be overheard by people who couldn't understand that language, that would make sense but you just wonder like how do they get away with anything when they're so loud? And I asked myself why does Catherine de Medici get all the good lines? So after all her stuff has been taken away and Catherine has to live with this tiny ass bare ass room, like she confronts the the other three Marys who are overseeing this whole thing, mm. realising that obviously if they're here to carry out Mary's orders that means Mary must not be there. They all take turns in sitting outside of her cell to make sure that no one's coming in who aren't allowed and at one point she tries to manipulate Kenna. Let me try and find the scene. Lovely Kenna. As long as we're stuck here together. You on guard duty, me under guard. Let's speak frankly, shall we? My advice, if you want it, is to leave Mary's service as soon as she leaves France and go someplace far away from politics. You're not smart enough to survive at court, but you are pretty enough to land a good husband and to lead a nice, quiet life. You're awfully confident. Why shouldn't I be? Sebastian is already captured by now with a traitor's daughter. Or else, if he's foolish enough, he's gone into the bloodwood. Either way, my problems are soon to be solved. Are you sure you want to be sharing all of your plots with me? Do you think I care what the king's former bed thing chooses to gossip? Spoken words aren't evidence. They vanish like smoke in the wind as soon as they're spoken. Surely all the king's promises taught you that. You're so very right. Hmm. Thank you. Where are you going? I'm not done abusing you. You're taking away my only amusement! The next time we see her after the birthing scene and abusing the pagans, da 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 My god, this is a long bit. Yes, the next morning, Susan shows up and Susan has two letters. Okay, so it was Kenna's idea to make fake letters that Jermaine wrote because Jermaine's got the best handwriting and was able to copy Catherine de Medici's handwriting. And so they have two letters, one saying hiring an assassin to attack Bassi. If that's given to the king, it will be used as evidence to have her executed. And the other one is a more appealing one that says that she is planning to have a ma- throw a massive feast in honour of Bassi at her expense, I think. So Susan tells her, if any harm comes to them, I will make sure that everyone sees the letter where you have hired the assassin. And Catherine's just like, well, I underestimated you. 
I clearly underestimated all of you. I really liked uh, Anna Popova's performance in that scene because it's just like, I am someone who has nothing to lose. I have been waiting for this moment for ages. I have been waiting to see the look on your face when you know you have been trapped, when I hold all the cards. And remember, Susan hasn't got anything to lose. Her boyfriend was murdered by Catherine de' Medici, plus her entire family died in a train crash, but that's another story. So that was a kind of a cool scene, because even though it shows that Catherine's been had, like, it doesn't make her come off as stupid. It just so shows that even she had the flaw of underestimating people that she thought were unimportant. I think that's that's it for the episodes. Is that all I have to talk about? Oh yeah, during that um, burial scene, Bassey and Mary do kiss. Obviously, even though Mary might have feelings for Bassey, they're not, they're never going to be as strong as they were for Francois, unless I could be wrong. He's hopeful that they could be together, even if she might not love him. She's like, I can compromise. I might not love you in the way I love Francois, but we can at least be close. And then they kiss. And then that's the end of the episode. And what was the worst dress? Oh, it was tricky, but um, there's this... Uh, floral corset dress that Mary wears towards the end of the episode when they are presenting Isabel's body to the council and I didn't like it because one of these reasons is I don't like many of these corset dresses because these corsets are not only cut wrong for the time period but also these corsets should not as they are appear on on top of the dress instead of underneath the dress shouldn't really be visible plus the, the design of the corset it looks too German for a French taste because remember these are supposed to be like the best French fashions money can buy and even Ken is wearing a dress that looks way too German when in that scene where Catherine is trying to manipulate her. I know that this scene sort of reminds me of something but I can't remember what it is. The scene of someone who is inside the cell trying to sweet talk someone outside the cell to manipulate them. That has happened quite a bit before but in other stuff I, it might have a TV tropes um, thing but I can't remember where it, uh, where I might have seen something like this before. Anyway, that was episode 10 of Rain. And I just got one more to review, and that's the first half of the season finished. It gets crazy, but this was actually quite an enjoyable episode. Um, not so much the stuff with Mary and Bassey, but the, the, I think the, the stuff of the, uh, the, th the now three Marys trying to outsmart Catherine de' Medici and succeeding. At least the actors are into their roles. They're not half-heartedly doing these performances. I think obviously my favourite character so far is Catherine de Medici. It's Megan Follows' his performance. She's a much more enjoyable character than even Cersei, especially Cersei in the last few seasons. Jesus Christ. She, she's just awesome. I really like the way she acts brutalness, her DGAF-ness about everything. So I just wonder how much the, the three Marys are going to find out when she gets to have her revenge on them because she has to have some sort of revenge against them. Anyway, we'll find out. I'm going into the next 11 episodes completely blind apart from a few details like Henry's death and at some point Susan and Francois are supposed to sleep together. Anyway, so thank you for watching. I'll see you next week, obviously, if you have Duke and Duchess or King and Queen tier patronage on Patreon, then obviously you can see the, the next one ahead of time. So thank you to my King and Queen patrons who get a shout out in the credits of every video I do, practically every video I do. Thank you, Alison Cuff, Larissa, Lady Eternal, Leslie Williams, Jill My Nero. Thank you so much. And remember, you can support the channel by becoming a patron or if you're unable to do so. Please just make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next lot of vlogs or any other videos that I do. Please leave a like on the video and share it around and maybe there's someone you know who watched Rain a long time ago and you just want to see them squirm as I bitch about it. See you next time.